Hello, everyone, and a happy, healthy, and successful 2024 to all of you. My name is Philippe Massancier, and I'm Helen Norton's Public Affairs Global Chair. I'm delighted to welcome you to this discussion focused on geoeconomic risks in 2024 and beyond. To walk us through some of the challenges and the opportunities, we have with us today two distinguished members of the Helen Norton External Experts team. Elvia Fabry is a senior research fellow at the Jacques Delors Institute in Brussels and Paris, in charge of the geopolitics of trade and rapporteur of the working group on EU-China relations. Elvia's area of expertise include EU bilateral trade negotiations, EU-US relations, EU-China relations, investment, global governance, and WTO reform. She is the co-author of a much talked about report published in November 2023 on the EU and China between de-risking and cooperation scenarios by 2035. Michael Wiegel is research director at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. He's also an adjunct professor in international political economy at the University of Tampere in Finland and a visiting professor at Oxford University. Mikael is a member of the World Economics Forum Expert Network, currently curating the WEF's geoeconomics section. He is an editor of geoeconomics and power politics in the 21st century. His work focuses on great power politics, geoeconomics, hybrid threats, and the political economy of development, all areas he has provided policy briefings and reports um, on for the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the Government of Finland, as well as for international organizations such as the World Economic Forum or the Japan Development Bank. You should be able to find links to their latest publications in the events chat. We will have presentations by our two speakers um, before turning the floor to the audience for Q&As. So please drop questions in the chat um, as we go um, and indicate who they are intended to, either Elvira, Mikhail or both. And I will relay them to our panelists. Now, let's um, turn to the subject at hand, geoeconomic risk in 2024 and beyond. The world is facing the biggest election year in history. 78 countries will see over 4 billion voters called to the polls in 2024, starting with Taiwan last weekend. That includes seven of the um, G20 members and three of the world's largest economies, the US, the EU and India. It also means potential instability and therefore uncertainty for the world's economic outlook, depending on the policy choices resulting from the newly elected governments. Clearly, 2024 starts with a host of challenges. China's sputtering growth, the world's major shipping companies stopping transit in the Red Sea, and the second largest economy in South America at serious risk of default. And that's just scratching the surface. The United States and Germany, the world's number one and number four economies, have self-imposed fiscal rules that tie the hands of their governments, even as they deal with crisis. Last November, Germany's constitutional court forced the German government to redo its entire 2024 budget to fit in the um, debt break rules. Late in December, Germany's governing coalition reached a deal, but the compromises have put that coalition at risk. Combine Germany's situation with the US debt limit hitting January 1st, 2025, and you can see why, the de why next December is a looming fiscal cliff uh, for some of the key pillars of the global economy. In China, the economy is widely expected to slow this year with the weakening of the property market and local and external demand cited as primary causes, uh, while the outlook for China's gov um, government debt has recently downgraded from neutral to negative. To try fixing this, China is pumping hundreds of billions into its manufacturing sector. But Beijing is going to need someone to buy all those goods. With its own domestic consumption at near all-time uh, lows, China will have to look back to the West. Of course, the United States and Europe are not going to take well to a scale up in Chinese exports, especially in an election year. The EU um, anti-dumping investigation on electric vehicles is just the beginning. 2024 is likely to be a year of new trade fights. So now that I have painted a bleak and dire picture, how wrong or right 
am I in my assessment? To help read the tea leaves and make uh, sense of the conflicting data being thrown at us, let me turn to our two um, Helen Norton external experts, and specifically to you, Mikhail, to walk us through an overview of geoeconomic trends and challenges in 2024. Thanks so much, Philip, um, and it's a pleasure pleasure to be here. Um, what I want to really to start with is is perhaps take the policymakers' perspective, and in order for us to understand a bit how the policymaker thinks these days, because it's very very different from before. And in order to manage risk effectively, we need to be able to understand how a policymaker thinks in this new environment. And the first thing to take into consideration is that. The policymaker these days um, thinks that the economy and business has become have become too important to be left to economists and business alone. It, the state is back in the economy. That's 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 clear. Um, so the logic of global economic relations is really really changing these days. Um, first of all, if we can have the next next slide, please. Um, first. We, we moved from an environment where policymakers thought that economic interdependence was a good thing. They had a very positive view on economic interdependence. That's out of the window now. New, the policymaker is now focused on strengthening self-sufficiency, strengthening economic autonomy. They see a lot of risks and vulnerabilities with economic interdependencies, so less interdependence. We also have a change in the in the perspective on efficiency. So. From having seen uh, economic policy making as strengthening efficiency, the purpose with economic policy making strengthening efficiency, that's not true anymore. Now there's a lot of highlighting, a lot of focus on strengthening economic resilience. Again, that means a lot of industrial policies, a lot of new instruments that wasn't there before. So there are two interrelated agendas that have really rose to the top of economic policy makers around the world, really, and that's de-risking. And that's the economic security policies, uh, which has become a centerpiece of national security policies. In fact, um, we could go go forward a bit. So what what we what what we need really to make sense of these huge changes in economic policy making is a re, is a new framework, because market economics that we were we we're being used to think in terms is really not that effective in understanding these transformations. So we need a new analytical framework. What I offer here in that sort of way is what I call geoeconomics or what can be called geoeconomics. So we see a rise of geoeconomics in economic policy making around the world, including the United States and Europe. Um, what geoeconomics really is about is, is the use of economics and economic policy making for very strategic, for political goals. We see that uh, happening around all the great powers. Next slide, please. Um, and it really has to do with the fact that economic and security policy making that used to be separate spheres of policy making and decision making, they become increasingly enmeshed. So more and more economic instruments and economic policies are made with security goals in mind and vice versa. Security policies are being done with economic instruments very much these days, which uproots really the norms and rules that have been governing our international economy for a long time. The WTO is in a frozen state because of this rise of geoeconomics. It's not the trade re international trade regime is not functioning at the moment. The US, for instance, has opted out in effect from the international trade regime. Next slide, please. So what I'll be very shortly focusing here is, is really three trends that goes with this rise of geoeconomics. The weaponization of the economy, the securitization of the economy and the balkanization of the economy. And we start, we start with uh, the weaponization of the economy, which really means that economic policy these days is used as a strategic weapon. And we can see that in the usage of sanctions. It's on historically historical levels. No time in history has there been as much sanctions used as these days, not only by the US and Europe, but increasingly we see that also with uh, the, the big countries in the global south and with China. 
Mind you, China is preparing a new framework for the more effective use of sanctions. China has not traditionally been using much sanctions. Now it's really moving in that direction. And we will see China using much more economic sanction going forward. We also see companies being used for espionage these days. There are uh, technical advantage, adva advances that make espionage, industrial espionage, much more effective, much more easy to use these days. And companies are being leveraged for these purposes, especially by uh, economies outside the Western realm. And that's something to, to, to be very aware of. And we see the purposeful use of corruption as well. The purposeful corrupting of economic stakeholders in the West, also something to, to be on the look of. So corporate vulnerability, sanctions, corruption, espionage is increasing. Next slide, please. As the economy is being weaponized, it also needs then from a policymaking view to be securitized. I'm not speaking of securities here in the investment sense. I'm speaking about protecting your home economies. So we see security sensitiveness increasing very, very much in economic policymaking. And that's why we have all these new more or less protectionist instruments being taken into play by policymakers around the world. Investment screening, inbound, outbound, export controls, especially when it comes to high technology, restrictions on R&D cooperation. Companies are not free anymore to cooperate in R&D with any external actors whatsoever. There are restrictions on that. There are data localization regulations, reshoring subsidies, and huge new industrial policy packages, subsidies. So we see broader state intervention, especially in very strategic sectors of the economy, especially high technology. Next slide, please. With these protectionist instruments, we it, it it it's sort of the consequence of that is of course that the world economy starts to fragment into different blocks. That's what I call the balkanization, really, which has to do with the disintegration of our global economic networks into these smaller ecosystems. We can already from the data see a lot of decoupling of global value and supply chains, especially in technology in high technology but more and more accelerating also in other sectors. We see more competition in uh, the technical standard setting regimes. So before that I can use my mobile phone anywhere in the world has to do, do with the fact that market actors have agreed on common technical standards on using this technology, right? And that has been not relatively problem free for a long time. That's not the case anymore. In the international st technical standards setting regime, there's a lot of competition these days. States are coming in there to dictate the rules and trying to set the new standards for new technologies. And that's, of course, a huge risk for all uh, companies that are involved with technological innovation and a lot of new costs. So what we're effectively seeing these days are clear signs of some sectors deglobalization, but, but re-globalization very much as well, the revining of global supply and value chains around more of a, a regional areas. Next slide, please. So what this all amounts to actually is a transition to a new economic model in effect. So we're moving in the West. We've been used to, market cap to the market capitalist model in the West where the state really intervenes in the economy in a very limited way. And when it does so, it, it intervenes for economic reasons, to correct the market failure, to have more efficiency in the economy. Well, that's starting to become more and more history. Now we see the state intervening much more in the economy, especially in certain sectors of very strategic sectors of the economy and for security reasons, not necessarily for economic reasons, but for very security driven reasons. This does not mean that we're moving in the West, in Europe or United States to any Chinese uh, model of state capitalists where the state really intervenes over the board in the economy and for very political reasons. That's not probably not where we're going, but we're going into this sort of middle of the road new model. And that will mean a lot of changes to the business environment, to the international business landscape, of course. Next slide, please. So just a few concluding points on consequences 
for corporate strategy from these huge changes in the economic international economic environment. First of all, supply chain management is no longer a purely corporate task. The state will want to have a say in how you deal with supply chains. It will there will be much more regulation in supply chain management going forward. Secondly, there's a need for businesses to really um, define, implement and communicate their geoeconomic risk appetite for a number of reasons, but investors will also will really want to see that going forward as well as geoeconomic risk becomes more prominent. Sanctions, vulnerability assessments, mit and mitigation plans is, of course, much, much more important in this new environment. Um, it's also much more important to really um, check for where the, where the funding comes from. Certain countries, certain investors, where there are huge sovereign wealth funds, for instance, that might be important for, for funding businesses, they are a bit becoming off the charts. They are becoming, uh, in a due diligence sense, uh, not, not, that, not that good. So one needs to be careful with with that, that sort of, with, with investors. The criticality of the technologies and products will, of course, shape uh, company strategic leeway going forward as the state starts to intervene more, intervene more heavily in, in very strategic sectors of the, of, of the site, such as technology. So it becomes, to conclude with, it becomes extremely important for businesses to really invest in corporate regulatory agility and pushback power against the state. And corporate coping capacity, because it's clear that regulation and costs are going up and one needs to be able to deal with those. Thanks. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mikhail. And for everyone on the call, don't hesitate to drop um, questions in the chat uh, that we will be able to um, go back to uh, our panelists with uh, shortly. Elvia, turning over to you, the audience and I would be interested in both your reaction or comments, uh, obviously, to Michael's overview and how you see it impacting the relationship between the three global uh, economic powers that are China, the EU and the US. Um, Mikhail just talked about the weaponization, securitization and balkanization of the global economy. How does that fit with the scenarios you developed around China, uh, for instance? Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. The first thing I have to say is that I'm completely aligned on Mikhail's uh, description of the new landscape and the fact that we are really moving from an area to, an, to, to, to a new area, but we don't know really what's how this landscape is going to look like. Yesterday at Davos, the president of Davos uh, started opening a panel saying, OK, we are between two orders. I think he was over optimistic and that we uh, we don't see very well yet what could, what can be the new order, and, and the challenge is rather to to try to assess to to what will be the rhythm of uh, uh, of fragmentation and uh, and the lines of that fragmentation. Uh, there's an in, obviously there's an increasing volatility in geopolitical risks, and, and at this stage the point is not so much to try to assess how we can get out of the negative spiral in in the war in Ukraine. Uh, in the Middle East and what we could even uh, fear for around Taiwan. But what we see is that those regional conflicts now cannot be treated regionally by, by, by companies. They, they, they are completely interconnected uh, and, and we're facing really global risks. And that means for the, for the companies to have a, like the, the, the big picture of this fragmentation and, and try to, to have a better assessment of, the, of this fragmentation. What, what, what we're facing is not a deglobalization, it's a slobalization. It's a decrease of the, uh, the, the, of the, the, the increase of, uh, of, of trade uh, at the global level. It's a reorganization of supply chains. And, and it was recently announced that uh, ASEAN became the first partner of, uh, of China for, for, ex for Chinese exports. But what it means is that we have longer value chains today uh, with more intermediation with the countries taking the opportunity uh, of this de-risking de framework to uh, to 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 be uh, uh, to be inter to I mean to to be intermediates uh, with, with big countries uh, like the US or, or, or countries from from the EU, Japan or elsewhere. And we, we have seen the rise of, uh, of Vietnam, of Mexico. Uh, but but they still using Chinese components, so it's just a sort of extension of those value chains, uh, while companies are trying to to diversify. 
the, the, the world economy has been very resilient in face of the black swans that we have been facing and uh, and uh, and this is this is a good uh, this is a good sign the, the point is not so much to see what we can expect in terms of black swan it's rather to increase the resilience of the the global economy in front of uh, facing that uh, that fragmentation and more specifically the resilience of uh, of, uh, of of companies and um, obviously, uh, you mentioned it, Philip, at the beginning. 24, it's going to, it's going to be a very, very specific in terms of uh, uh, with the weight of of the elections that we're facing. We, uh, as you said, it's half of the population of the world which is going to the polls, and we have more, uh, some more sensitive elections. Before I get to the U.S., the big question of the what what could be the impact of the U.S. election, we've just been through the the Taiwanese elections, and even if we can if we can appreciate, I mean, if we can assess, or uh, if the if the result of this election is a uh, it, it's um, it's reassuring, uh, what we see is that Taiwan uh, will be tempted to increase its diversification efforts. And uh, in, has already implemented some bans on some Chinese goods against the economic agreement that was signed a couple of years ago. And we can, what we can fear is already um, that China will be more aggressive in trying to prevent or to limit that diversification effort, and and could be uh, using a more uh, divisive uh, strategy by targeting with sanctions or rewarding some 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 investors. Uh, so partnering countries, which means that also for for foreign companies, it means to be to be quite careful. But moving to the European elections, um, the European elections, we expect to have some shifts uh, going to, in the direction of more conservative parties or even extreme right parties, which could which could lead to more protectionism, at least a more call for more uh, um, economic nationalism. And that happens at a moment when China is really expecting to, to, I mean, is really willing to keep some access to the European market because it has to deal with its overcapacities, notably in the in the green sector. So this is something that is that that may uh, that may need to be looked at very carefully, depending on the the, the initiative that the uh, the Commission uh, uh, takes until the European elections. And what will come out after from of the of the next uh, European Parliament and the next uh, and the next Commission, but the huge uh, the huge uh, um, issue will be, of course, the result of the U.S. elections, and uh, and the whole question is it's going to be uh, if um, if uh, what will what will be the impact of the campaign itself and what will be the results of uh, uh, of a second mandate of Donald Trump. I mean, we, we have listened already to his announcement on increasing 10% on all U.S. Uh, imports, uh, banning U.S. investment in, in China, banning some key uh, imports of uh, uh, Chinese goods or, te or technologies. What we, what we anticipate is a hugely disruptive factor for the global economy and uh, an and, 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 and acceleration of retaliation measures between, between the blocs. Um, the main the main structural factor that we have to look at between in between I would say in the short term is uh, the evolution of the Chinese economy and more specifically the reaction of Xi Jinping to that to what we expect to be a deceleration progressive deceleration of the uh, of Chinese growth even if the the figures I mean the numbers that have been uh, uh, published uh, yesterday between yesterday and today. Uh, that show that uh, uh, maybe more positive results for the, the Chinese growth at the end of 2023 with a sort of slightly relaunch of Chinese consumption. What we see is that that deceleration of China uh, will, will, will be, uh, could, could lead to China to, to take a very different, uh, very different decision and, and reaction which could lead to in chain a chain of uh, reaction in, in the EU and the US. Um, so having said that, just to say a word about those scenarios that we have uh, explored in, in that report, it's it's a report which is more focused on EU-China relations and which has sectoral approaches uh, by, by issue. But if uh, if I can 
mention just briefly uh, those related to the risking, which have uh, also, I mean, which which can be interpreted as well for other countries than the, than the European ones. Um, we're basically uh, facing less in the short term, but in the, in, in the mid term for for trends. Uh, two extreme ones. The one that concerns Taiwan, which is the worst one. If if we if we were faced to uh, uh, a decision uh, of C to to invade Taiwan, uh, it would all. I mean, the impact. We we know the impact. Uh, if it happens in the sh rather short term, uh, and and it, and it leads to to a military confrontation, the, the the impact on global economy would be devastating, and for all supply chains. Uh, we, we, we all have anticipated that scenario, but if, I, we, if we put that apart and if we consider what would be a more cooperative scenario, uh, it's not also a very obvious scenario, which it, it, it would mean that uh, Xi Jinping would, uh, uh, to, 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 to counter uh, the deceleration of its economy, would take some more positive decision going back on export restrictions, and uh, and taking some initiatives uh, rather in the in the direction of a fairer competition. This is not very this is not very realistic in the in the short term, obviously. So let's not comment that uh, so much. Even because it would also request uh, for that more cooperative uh, scenario to have a, a second mandate of Biden and a president re-engaging at the W2 level, uh, which is not also so uh, so obvious but the the, the what we, what we should consider is uh, is rather the two medium scenarios and how we we may risk to shift from what could be a scenario of um, uh, of uh, coexistence uh, order coexistence uh, to uh, and the move to a scenario of accelerated confrontation and that may depend on the evolution of the chinese economy uh, first of all, if, if uh, the, the deceleration is confirmed and that it's perceived as less as a threat by, by the US and that what is already de a decoupling trend, not only the risking, but the coupling trend in, in the sector of the, the, sec uh, of the technologies uh, could be limited to that sector. It could lead some leeway, uh, I mean, it could lead some leeway for coordination between the US and some partners, but it could also lead some leeway for Third countries, Europeans, but Japanese, or in many other countries in other regions, to continue to find some space for investment in China in some in some sectors, and not to be working more closely with uh, with private companies. What we could expect is to have less new investment in China, but rather the companies which are already in China trying to preserve the the the, the investment and even maybe increasing the investment. Um, and uh, and uh, we, we have a, a, a big group of non-aligned countries uh, with which uh, we, we uh, diversification could, uh, uh, could could also lead to, uh, to 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 increase investment in in those countries. But if the Chinese economy, uh, with more investment in innovation and automation, uh, was to 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 slightly rebound and to to figure to be a, a, a bigger threat for for the U.S. Uh, and obviously, if we had a, a second mandate of uh, of Donald Trump, uh, we, we could expect much more quick uh, com quicker uh, degradation in the situation with escalation in confrontation of uh, sanctions. Uh, uh, and uh, and that that would lead uh, that would lead the, the, the uh, to a much more uh, confused and quicker uh, de-risking, uh, not only diversification but de-risking with a lot of bottlenecks in in uh, in supply chains, um, much less opportunity in non-aligned countries which could look for more security guarantee. Uh, and opting for one block or the other, uh, and that's maybe I mean that may be the scenario that should be really looked at much more carefully uh, by, by by companies. Not thank not you. only okay. Th thank Let's you very I much, Adir, on that. Um, I'm just taking um, note of a couple of things. I'd like to turn it back to the both of you shortly, and then open it up for questions. 
you both talked about um, a change of era, uh, a new order. Um, use a, a word if I got it right, Elvia, uh, which I hadn't heard. You, you said it wasn't globalization, it was globalization, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yes. Um, how do we, de I mean, you talked about de risking, but how do we de risk? What should CEOs have uh, top of mind? I will ask um, Mikhail first and then you, Elvia, but try and keep it um, short um, so we can then turn it over um, to uh, questions. Mikhail. Well, thanks. Uh, well, if, if we think of Something that really CEO needs to prioritize in their risk frameworks going forward. I think it's flow control. Uh, so what I'm what do, what do I mean by that? It's that most business models in the West have been really geared towards reaping benefits from globalization. In essence, sort of reaping benefits from leveraging global economic flows, be it goods flows, capital flows, data flows, commodity flows. Well, all these flows are now experience a lot of friction and more friction as we will go along. So businesses can no longer count on the free flow of capital goods data etc which means that those businesses that can steer clear of friction to these flows will have an edge over those that are not that cannot not to mention businesses that are able to control critical economic flows they will become indispensable right so think of the chinese electric vehicles producers who are now overtaking traditional car producers in many markets around the globe. Tesla is actually the second electric vehicle producer these days. It's not the first anymore. Why? Because the Chinese control almost the entire supply chain, chain of production, which means that they, can, they encounter less friction and they are not relying on outsourced global supply chains, but on leveraging Chinese industrial policy. So risk frameworks, risk management frameworks in the West need to be revamped for these sorts of geoeconomic risk and, and, and business model towards sort of flow control, as I call it, going forward. Thank you, Mikhail. Um, Elvia, what about de-dollarization or, you know, is it something that we should be um, thinking about, concerned about um, in terms of, um, of, uh, of business leaders? Well, what, what, what we see is that uh, China was trying to, uh, I mean, intended to de-dollarize since uh, two 2004. But what, we, what is really uh, now uh, more, more evident is that into, in 2023, it has really speed up the de-dollarization. And we have really reached uh, a, a ceiling with, uh, with the numerous uh, multiplication of uh, partnerships uh, with with uh, with countries and uh, and and abrupt switch like like Brazil, um, but I I, I think that um, it's going to be an increasing trend. Not only because China is uh, speeding the promotion of the RMB, but because because of the increasing threat of uh, multiplication of sanctions, uh, some some other countries and even allies of the of the US may be tempted also to in, if not increase the the, the currency like the Europeans, uh, the euro, also uh, try to prevent them from from to be exposed to to uh, to to uh, the possibility of uh, being targeted by by those sanctions. Having said that, I, I don't think that uh, deglobalization should be considered at this stage as a global problem. I mean, the use of the RMB, even if it uh, has really increased. Uh, it's, it's not uh, it has nothing to to be compared with the with, with the use of the dollar. It has to be considered rather at regional or even country by country uh, country by country situation. And for the countries that are increasingly using in the trade the the dollar, uh, the implication uh, the implication is also that they they have an increasing dependency on trade. Uh, bec because they, 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 the 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 cannot be changed uh, to to another currency, so they are they are trapped in that uh, uh, in, in the use of B. So we have to, to we have to see more in the midterm what will be the impact. Uh, but just a last remark concer concerning the the BRICS initiative to launch their own currency. I think this is a at this stage this is not uh, this is not an issue. Mikael, any uh, comments on actually the BRICS, actually on this initiative, um, or um, on the rise of the BRICS and what it means in 2024, as on January 1st, we got, I think, six new um, countries that joined uh, the BRICS. I believe that in 
2022, we saw the curves crossing between the G7 countries and the BRICS countries in terms of their respective shares of GDP. Um, anything particular in 2024 or in the coming years around um, uh, the BRICS or BRICS Plus? Well, a short mention on the on the de-dollarization question. It's interesting that you should mention de-dollarization in connection with de-risking because in, it's really it's a way. It's the de-risking policy of the global south, especially the BRICS countries, right? Who certainly have stepped up their efforts to reduce the use of the dollar in the world trade. So for them, de-dollarization equates with de-risking because of sort of three reasons: the ability to reduce their vulnerability to U.S. financial sanctions the ability to replace a shortage of dollars that some of them are now uh, encountering and the ability to hedge against economic fragmentation. So especially China now has a deliberate policy of de-dollarization and renminbi internationalization. Um, and it does that by establishing renminbi clearing banks around the world, most recently in Brazil, by establishing bilateral currency swap lines and through the Chinese cross-border interbank payment system, which tries to replace the SWIFT, right? So through these means, China sort of provides economic shelter to the other the vulnerable countries, including other BRICS countries, especially those with problematic relations to the United States. And at the same time, China gains financial power at the expense of the United States. Now, that, that does not mean any rapid de-dollarization that it would be imminent that it's not. Um, and the renminbi is certainly not on its way to replace the US as a reserve the US dollar as a reserve cur currency. But the data shows actually movement, especially in central bank reserves, where holdings of US dollar is shrinking little by little. So there's a and and what that would mean concretely for companies and investors in global north, um, it would mean dearer US imports depreciation and poorer performance of U.S. financial assets, more divestments from divestments from the U.S. Uh, so certainly a need to hedge against the structurally depressed dollar and from a more political perspective, reduced ability for U.S. sovereign debt, but also reduced ability to use sanctions for the, uh, as a foreign policy tools, tool of the U.S. So, but this is not an imminent thing in 2024, it's more sort of a, a, a thousand paper cuts, little by little movement at, at, at this point, right? Um, very good. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Before we turn it to um, the um, uh, audience, we have a couple of questions coming up. I'd like from uh, Elvira and from you in one minute, three takeaways that you'd like people to leave this um, uh, event, this discussion with. Elvia, we'll start with you. Three takeaways, 2024 okay. geoeconomics. Geoeconomics. Uh, well, first, I think that one thing that is important is that as, as we see that uh, all the countries are equipping themselves with their economic security strategy, we need to have business stepping in and, and make, making it heard. Uh, we lack forums of discussion uh, to, to have that dialogue between, uh, with, between governments or public institutions, if we're talking about the EU. And and, uh, uh, and the business sector, but that will be decisive if you want to prevent to have a sort of a, uh, the, the negative the ne negative impact of, of the risking. Uh, that's that's one thing. Um, the uh, the other thing is that uh, I think for the moment we, we we're trying to delimit the de risking uh, uh, the de risking strategies uh, at at the level of the small yard, as Jake Sullivan mentioned it. But we have to anticipate that when we're talking about artificial intelligence, uh, quantum computing, it will go through all business and that it will be very difficult just to delimitate uh, uh, the, 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 the risking uh, strategies to some sectors and, and, and expect uh, that some business will, will, will think that they will be uh, safe uh, uh, out of that small yard. And um, and the third thing is that we we need to have a much better assessment of the innovation capacity in in China, because there's more and more uh, appeal to have access to the Chinese ecosystem of innovation, and and not not only for production, but that also will be a very risky uh, risky initiative 
because the, 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 that ecosystem will also pre present some much more risks for of, of uh, quick uh, regulatory changes and uh, and expose companies to uh, to even even if they intended to develop some R and D uh, centers in China for Chinese production uh, out of the the other research and development centers. Thank you very much, Elvia. Mikhail. Three quick takeaways. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, companies will need to up their ability to manage higher costs, persistent high, persistently higher costs, and more regulation. Uh, the geoeconomic developments that that sort of is underway, they will push up costs for companies, and the red tape is certain to increase. So that calls for more corporate agility and coping capacity. The second point is investing in home and friendly markets. Protectionism is back uh, and picking up speed, and that means that business models that rely on open global markets are a bit in trouble, in fact. Um, instead, businesses will have to learn how to make use of the new industrial policies in their home and other friendly markets. Third point, um, strengthening supply chain resilience. So most supply chains are impacted by these current geoeconomic developments, and these can no longer be evaluated. So supply chains can no longer be evaluated solely in terms of efficiency, but will need to be assessed also from a resilience perspective. So that means strengthening geoeconomic risk assessments, scenario planning, geoeconomic due diligence, and in identifying opportunities for diversification, including onshoring. Thank you both very much. Um, plenty of food for thought that you're leaving us with. I will now open it to um, the uh, Q&A uh, part of the uh, discussion. And I will start with a question by Carla Zamora about risk that you, either of you, perceive for companies in this context, in this context concerning the implementation of their uh, ESG strategies. So how does that fit, you know, with the fragmented, slow -balized world that we have? And I will ask the both of you to respond, but to try and keep it um, short, please, because we've got a few questions coming up. Uh, Mikhail. Well, yes, ESG is, of course, uh, a, a really important thing these days, and uh, there is no going back on the decarbonization trend. That's certainly another trend that I wasn't taking up in my initial notes, but decarbonization is going on and it's picking up and accelerating, and ESG goes with that trend very much, uh, especially if you are in, in a sector where branding and image is of importance, then ESG ratings will be important, of course, as well. Elvira? Well, in, in, in a way, there's a common, uh, I mean, there's a common line between the risking and, and decarbonization. Sorry, I think uh, we've lost the ear. You lost me? No, sorry, you're back. Okay. <laughs> now, I was, I, I was just saying that there's a convergence between the de-risking issue and decar decarbonization, as much in terms of identification of uh, of countries, uh, uh, of countries with the. Uh, with all the problems that we will be dealing with the extractions and and the modalities of extraction uh the the way we're gonna manage uh, supply chains transportation the costs um what it means is that in in the for the two situations for the two objectives we need to have that broader overview of supply chains which michael uh, Mikhail already uh, already mentioned, but it means for the for for business not only to have an overview on tier one, tier two, but try to have that more uh, sy systemic view of supply chains. So it would have implications not only uh, I mean in, in terms of uh, information efforts and 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 information management within a company uh, with all the subsidiaries uh, and and. Uh, uh, and to inc to increase uh, or exactly uh, what was mentioned before, to increase the capacity to to have monitoring on regulatory changes uh, and more more information sharing 
also between between companies and between the public and the private sector Perfect, uh, to 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 have that uh, uh, really big picture. Thank you very much. I will turn on to a question that was posed by Matthew Miner. Can you discuss what you see as the future of the Belt and Road Initiative in light of um, Italy's effective withdrawal um, from the uh, from the uh, the scheme? Well, I can I can jump on uh, on this one quickly. Sure. Uh, sure. The, the Italian withdrawal was already expected. Uh, the political announcement came at a, at a, at a key moment. I think we uh, the, the point is not so much to to uh, to focus on this one, but to see the trends of the of the Belt and Road, and uh, we 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 know that there have been rising criticism on on the uh, deceleration of investment uh, uh, and, and the continuation of some projects. What I would be paying more attention to is the willingness of the, of China to repaint its Belt and Road in green and to take opportunity of these avenues to export all its overcapacity in, in green technologies. And, and that is something on what China is betting. It's trying to relaunch its, uh, re I mean, its economy also by exporting more, uh, providing access to all the members of the Belt and Road to its uh, electronic uh, vehicles, uh, uh, wind turbines and, uh, and etc. And that is something that is may have also some weight on the way the the the, the countries of the global south are looking at uh, the U.S., the EU, which are criticised for their uh, domestic market first, let's say, uh, industrial inv investment focus really on their domestic uh, domestic market, and notably in the case of Europe, which is criticised more for its uh, uh, green protectionism and increasing. Uh, piling up of uh, of green regulations. Mikael? Yeah, just uh, I think it's important to understand that the BRI is really the centerpiece of Chinese grand strategy, uh, which has been one a strategy of trying to bind up other countries to China. So through investment, through loans, through these big infrastructure project projects, China has made other countries dependent on China. And through that, China rises as a global power, right? Now that project is a bit in trouble. First of all, because of Chinese own economic woes. So it's becoming a bit in question whether China can actually deliver on all its promises when it comes to these big projects. So other countries are becoming a bit more, bit more wary of those projects and, and engaging in the BRI. The second thing is that US and Europe has finally woken up to this grand mm -hmm. strategy and is making their counteractions so they're coming now with new the EU, for instance, with its big global gateway initiative, which is the, the sort of the counterpart of the BRI from the Europe side. And US has similar big infrastructure initiatives, global infrastructure in initiative put in place now. So we're seeing a competition for this connectivity that the infrastructure builds. And that's interesting, of course, from a Western point of view as well, because there are big opportunities in the European and US initiatives here now as well. I'll turn to you, uh, Mikael, to start, um, because I think it's a question that's um, uh, directed to you uh, about an interesting point you made about the importance of supply chains at home and in friendly markets. What would you what would be the outlook for US EU cooperation in the event of a second Trump presidency and I assume then more difficult um, EU US um, trade relations? Yeah, we probably can can count on a bit more difficulties. But on the other hand, if we really think about it, how much Biden's economic agenda actually differs from Trump's economic agenda. Not that much in the end. There's a big difference in rhetoric. But if you go underneath the, the, the rhetoric, underneath that surface, uh, I think the tr what Trump actually put in place already, the made in America economic strategy, and a lot of the new measures that have been taken into place, Biden has actually continued with that, with, with with many of those instruments. So it has not been such a big change under Biden from Trump, from a European perspective, actually. Of course, we will have hardening rhetoric. We will, we will have uh, perhaps new tariffs taken in certain sectors taken into, in, into, into play by a, a, a possible Trump administration. Um, and that will create more friction, of course, that, that's for certain. Um, but uh, 
uh, Europe has a now also a much of a focus on its own industrial policies as a counterweight to the IRA, for instance, in 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 US. So there is a bit of a competition for on subsidies on industrial policies that already goes on now at this point. I don't foresee so much difference under a prospective or under a possible Trump administration. In the end, we shouldn't at least we shouldn't sort of ex, uh, too much put too much emphasis on that. Olivia, do you agree with that? Um, I, I I would be a little more pessimistic in terms of uh, the turbulences. <laughs> uh, I would expect a little more turbulences because uh, um, because we we may face a more uh, a little more coherent Trump. Even if we uh, the the issue with Trump is to see what uh, on what direction he he could fire out. Um, but I think that um, what what we in relation to supply chains. Uh, it's going to be quite difficult for the U.S. Uh, with the Congress, uh, which is opposed to more trade agreements, uh, really to, uh, in addition to its uh, industrial policy efforts, to uh, to succeed to diversify its uh, its its trade relations, and that is something that may have an impact for other partners and companies coming from other uh, from other countries in terms of opportunities of access to to some markets um i i um uh, i notably i mean uh, i i mentioned uh, previously uh, vietnam mexico or those countries that are benefiting from those this reorganization of supply chains and now that we're really talking and focusing on all the additional constraints that we uh, companies may face, uh, there may also be be some some opportunities. Uh, but we will have to look at mo much more carefully at the countries wh wh which represent really an opportunity for new investment or diversification. I if we take, for example, India, uh, which is actually where I wanted to, which is where I wanted to take you probably for the last um, question there for the two of you, because we talked a lot about um, de risking strategy, but where does India fit in there? So, LB, you're going there, and maybe uh, Mikhail just after. Okay, quickly. Uh, well, India, everybody's focusing at India as uh, on India as the, the 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 ultimate alternative to to China. Uh, the EU is negotiating a trade agreement, but we see that it's difficult. Uh, the US is also trying to negotiate an ad hoc agreement, let's say, on components of, of electronic uh, goods uh, uh, versus visa, uh, the, the increasing visa. Uh, we may be, we may need to be a little more careful about uh, the, the the Indian opportunity. Uh, India is welcoming investment. But will it will it make uh, will it will Modi really change uh, the the policy on on trade on market opening? We still have to wait in the coming weeks to see the union budget to see if he's really giving some positive signals of more opening of the Indian market. Because on the other side, we see that the ecosystem in India is not the same like the one that companies can find in, in China. Mm. There's still there, there are still some very uh, infra pro problems around the infrastructure, uh, and uh, and that makes the Asian uh, countries much more appealing at this stage in the short term. Even if there's a huge potential for the Indian economy in the long term. Great, and I will then turn to Mikhail for the last question that just popped in the the chat. Geoeconomic risks applies both to companies but also to countries. How might foreign affairs departments, so I think we're talking more about um, um, governments here, be looking to adapt? And how should companies be prepared to engage in relation to these changes within governments? Yeah, so if, if we're talking about you know, geoeconomic risks, it's not a very established concept yet because most uh, risk frameworks concentrate on political risk and uh, uh, which are sort of country-based risk very much. Geoeconomic risks are transnational. They stem from the worsening relations between major states in the in the system so it has to do with so they they come from supply chains they can they have to do with the sort of new instruments that are taking to play because of this worsening of the international system as, as a whole so i think it's important for companies and countries as well 
to reframe a bit the, the, the perspective and how they look at risks. And it's not about, uh, only about traditional political risk, which is sort of country based, which are based based in a which has to do with the sort of normal factor that there's a military coup somewhere or or, or a regime that takes over, starts to nationalize industries. Now, I mean, geoeconomic risks are broader, transnational, uh, and that's something new in a way. We haven't seen those kinds of risks for a long time, uh, not even during, so much during the Cold War, because the Cold War was really a two blocks. They had nothing to, to do with each other hardly. So those were sort of separated. Now we're interconnected and the risks comes from those interconnections. And I assume uh, if I'm looking at that question, maybe a sort of slightly different recruitment in terms of the people who would be working those government agencies with maybe more uh, economists or is that you know would that be fair to say or Mikhail or for me, yeah no I, I definitely think that uh, there is a need for a new profession <laughs> almost uh, and and uh, political economists that are used to look at the intersection of politics and economics and that sort of data. So we're not to talking only m traditional market data, but one needs to really be able to look at the dependencies and the choke points in the world economy and flesh them out. And uh, and and that's the sort of the, the new geoeconomic data that we're not used to being to supply or demand. And we need to start demanding that sort of new data. Thank you very, very much. We're getting to the top of the hour. Um, and unfortunately, um, we have to uh, cut short for today. I'm really grateful to both of you, Avir and Mikhail, for having shared with us uh, some of your insights. Um, I'm taking away, or I'm leaving this uh, chat with a couple of new words like weaponization, securitization, and balkanization of the economy, and something that we really need to be. Um, uh, keeping as um, top of mind. And um, Elvir, I'm going to start looking at um, slobalization because this is something that uh, definitely um, uh, picked my uh, or tickled my interest uh, and something that we need to be perhaps uh, thinking and looking a bit more um, uh, about. Thank you both. Thank you also for what you've given us in terms of uh, de risking thoughts. Um, and I hope that all of you uh, will be joining us for our uh, next uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic uh, talk in a couple of uh, weeks. Thank you very much. And once again, a great start of 2024 to everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.